our Lord, that we consider today is taken from the gospel assigned for the day. We'll be looking at St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, starting with verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servants. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of our Lord. In Christ Jesus, my name is Pastor Krause. I'm coming to you from Christ Lutheran Church in Pewaukee, Wisconsin. As our message goes out today, we realize it goes out to members and also to those of you who are not members. We're so glad to have you here as we meditate on this section of the Word of our God. We realize some of you are close around here in the Milwaukee area. Others are scattered throughout the Midwest, the United States, and the world. Uh, God's blessings to you on this uh, Sunday of the end times. It's that time of the year. If you live here in southern Wisconsin, you know what I mean. It's starting to get colder, and there are things we have to take care of. We need to get into hoses. Perhaps we need to rake the leaves. We need to clean up the garden beds. We need to bring in the lawn furniture, because sooner or later it's going to happen. Suddenly there's going to be that layer of white snow which so often lasts for months here in southern Wisconsin. Whether we want to imagine it or not, whether we want to realize it or not, whether we are ready or not, winter will come upon us. That's the way it always is. And this is the time of the year for those of us who have been around the block a number of times as Christians that we expect to hear about the end times. Uh, we expect to hear about Judgment Day, the day of mourning, the day of reckoning, and so too today. Uh, this uh, story is told to us, this parable, uh, to reinforce uh, that uh, we want to be ready when that day comes. To each of us, as the parable is going to show, we have been given gifts and talents, and the Lord is serious about our use of them. When I look at Holy Scripture, I think one thing that is reinforced from beginning to end is that uh, God has given to us gifts 
and he is serious about our management of those gifts in our lives. On the basis of this parable, we use this theme, use them, use those gifts and talents, or lose them. Use them or lose them. The first thing we'd like to reinforce is that the master gives out gifts. He gives out talents. In this story, it's spoken about as gold. He's going to be going on a journey, and so he calls in his servants, his employees. He tells them that he is going to be going, and then he entrusts to them responsibility. He gives to them various bags of gold. How much was in one of these bags of gold? We don't know exactly. Uh, but if we look at these uh, stories, these parables that deal with gifts and talents, we probably could say that each bag of gold was about 19 years worth of wages. So each bag is maybe worth a million dollars conservatively. To one servant, he gives five million dollars. To another servant, he gives two million dollars. To another, he gives one million dollars. This is not some uh, little thing where somebody's giving out 10 bucks or $20 or something like this. This is a major trust which God gives to each of us. In the Declaration of Independence, most of us are familiar with that. It's a cherished document here in the United States. It is stated, all men are created equal. Well, to some degree, that's certainly true. We're created with a body and a soul. We have a heart inside of us that is beating in this respect and in other respects, all people are created equal. But in other respects, that's not true at all. We are very diverse human beings. There are men and there are women. There are short people and there are tall people. There are black people and white people. There are intelligent people and not so intelligent people. In the realm of the church, we speak about the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is ever so diverse. We can read about the body of Christ in a place like 1 Corinthians 12. When the body works together, it's magnificent. We think of the human body. We can reason. We can accomplish tasks. We can take part in athletic events. All sorts of different things that our body can do. But of course, you know, the body has more prominent parts, the head, the face, the hands, the feet. But if our body has a problem, even with the smallest muscle in our back, we won't know how to function. We can't even think straight if we are in pain because of some little part of the body that we've never seen in our life. The body has to work together. Here at our church, we have a very talented body. People do all sorts of different things here in the church, and we're so thankful for their talents. We have people who create the bulletins and the newsletters, people who make the music, our tech people who do things like uh, bring these sermons to you. And we think of people who do outside work, who cut the grass, who pull the weeds, who tend the, the garden beds here at the church. We think of the people who teach Sunday school to our little children or teach in the preschool to our little children, to those who teach teenagers, to those who teach adult Bible classes, to those who are in administrative tasks, who create the budgets, who administrate all the things that need to be administrated here around uh, the building and our church as such, to those who clean uh, all the different parts of our church, those who fix the toilets, and, and on and on and on. And when all these people are working together, amazing things can be done for the Lord. Now, when we think about gifts and talents, a few things might need to be said. So often I've seen these bumper stickers, and we are reminded that my son or my daughter is a straight A student at Timbuktu High School. He or she is an honor student, and we are so proud of them. And, you know, it's wonderful if people get an A in class. But, of course, for some students, that that's very easy to do. That didn't really take much work at all. 
But for other people, that might have been something extremely hard. We think about maybe a subject that we've struggled with, maybe not only in school, but throughout our life. Maybe we think, I'm not so good at math. I'm not so good at chemistry. I'm not so good at learning a foreign language. We think of the struggles that we have. But as a person who got out of high school decades ago, I think it's interesting that some of those students who had all those A's really never seemed to accomplish much in life. But other people who were involved in a struggle, other people maybe who had average gifts have excelled because of hard work, because of determination, because of people maybe alongside them who encourage them and help them uh, to achieve more than it was thought even by that person that they would ever achieve. And another word comes to mind when we think of our gifts and talents. And that is, even though we don't usually want to talk about this, we think to ourselves, I'm limited. I look at other people around me, and they seem to be in a whole better place in life. They seem to have greater gifts and talents. We're not here to be jealous about what other people have been given. But once again, how are we using the things that God has given to us in our specific sphere? Uh, the Bible speaks about this as the doctrine or the teaching of vocation. The Lord knows what he's doing. He's placed us into a place in life, a family perhaps, a business perhaps, a community, a church, and there is the place that he especially wants us to function. He's given to us gifts and talents, and they are varied, and they are different, God be praised, than those of others. But he wants us to use them. Whatever you do, we're told in Corinthians, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God of God. Is that the way that we perceive our gifts and talents and the things that we do? Are we doing them to the glory of our God? Here in this story we see that the person who was given five bags of gold, when the master returns he has five more bags and then those words which have such a beautiful ring to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Another person has other gifts and talents, maybe two bags of gold. And then those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the things that I have given to you. You realized what you had, and you sought in every way to serve your Lord and to serve your Master, to do this all for the glory of God. Years ago, there was a tragedy in our, in our family life. And I can remember that there was a person who sent me a check for a couple hundred dollars. And it was a fellow pastor. And I called that person up and said, I, I really don't think I should receive this gift from you because I know this was a sacrificial gift. And the person insisted that I take that money and use it to help our family at that particular time. And then he went on to say, and if you don't use it, and even if you do, however you use it, pass it on to somebody else in need when they're having a tragedy in their life. And I have to say that more than once, this money has gone out to other people. And I always think about the generosity of this man and his family for thinking of us at that particular moment in our lives, well before this pay-it-forward idea was ever introduced. Sometimes we fail to see the opportunities that are out there in front of us. I've been blessed to see the Dead Sea a number of times in Israel, lowest place in the face of the earth. You've you got to watch it. You can't put your face into that water. You dare not put your eyes into that water because of all the salt and all the chemicals. The waters come into the Dead Sea and there's no outlet, there's no place to go, and so slowly but surely those waters evaporate and those salts and those chemicals remain. The Lord gives to us 
opportunities, and he wants us to use those opportunities. We live in a time of great fear, and the natural reaction when we live at a time like this is to think of ourselves and to turn inward, to think of our own needs, to think of taking care of ourselves, to think about survival. But of course, the Lord says that we need to trust in him and to use our gifts, especially now, not for ourselves, but for others. A spiritual gift is something that we use for other people. It is not something that we selfishly use for ourselves. It is something that we freely give, just as the Lord has freely given to us. And we are told here, too, that the master will have an audit. Well, audit. If you live in the business world, that's not a pleasant word to hear. Maybe we have fears if there's going to be an audit because we've absconded money. Uh, we've done things that were not proper in the use of money. Or maybe we don't like the idea of hearing about an audit because somebody's going to be looking over our shoulder. How come you didn't do things this way? How come you didn't put those receipts in that column? How come you're doing these things in such an antiquated way? Who of us wants to be judged by others? Huh? But, of course, judgment is coming. The Lord is going to look at our lives. It's not going to be as trivial as uh, something like words spoken at a funeral. I've gone to scores of funeral and people say wonderful things. That's the whole idea of a time of eulogy, speaking a good word. Those words may be true, but quite often they may not be true. Maybe they're true for some people, but they're not for other people true when it comes to their knowledge of that person. But in the end, uh, in the end when it comes to judgment, God knows what he's doing. He says, either well done, good and faithful servants, and I have to look around me and see some here at church, and I think, wow, what dedication to the Lord. I would have to say I also think wonders of what people are doing, and I think about how the Lord much more to them than to me is going to ever say, well done, good and faithful servant. Of course, then uh, there are other people who are amazingly mediocre, who are amazingly underwhelming us or others around us. And we see that here in this story. Here is this person to whom the master gave a million dollars. And what did he do? He went out in his backyard and he buried it. And when the master came back, he goes, here it is. Here's your million dollars. I didn't make a million dollars. I didn't make five bags of gold more or two bags of gold more. Here's your bag of gold. It's all there. It's just like it was on the day that I buried it. And I think about people in the realm of God today people who want to somehow feel close to him, but somehow think, you know, I'm the kind of person who's an observer. I'm the kind of person who just doesn't get involved. When I look at the church, the church is there for baptism, for marriage, for a funeral. To put it in other terms, the church is there for people when they are matched or dispatched or discharged from this world. Uh, but uh, I don't really want to get involved. I want to come into a place like this, sit in the back pew, but don't ask me to get involved. It's just sort of a strange feeling. Is it not a cold feeling? I'm an observer. I'm just not going to participate. Well, we see what the Lord thinks of that. In the early church, People would gather together when they would worship. It'd be an amazing thing. It was so utterly otherworldly. People would be praising this God. And there was no God there. They would be singing all sorts of beautiful songs. They would be, no doubt, holding up their hands in praise. They're praying to this God. 
And people found it so amazingly interesting that they would stand around uh, those Christians who were worshiping. Eventually, they would build bleachers. And those people were called pagans. Today, a lot of people somehow want to watch what other people are doing and not participate and somehow get the feeling, the little bit of warm feeling that I'm, I'm close to God. But of course, being close to God is a relationship of love. Frederick Taylor was one of these gurus for business and industry back in the Industrial Revolution. And he used to say to workers, work harder and faster or we find, we'll find somebody who will. Well, somebody who will work harder and faster was typically a machine. Maybe you've been replaced or will be replaced by a machine. Now we think about working for the Lord. It isn't working harder or faster. But if we want to do more for the Lord, it's based on love. We might look up 1 Corinthians 13, that great chapter of love. Love endures all things, believes all things. Love is there for every facet of our lives. Now, this person who buried his million dollars, he looks to the Lord and he said, You, 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 God, are harsh. But of course, God is not harsh. Uh, God, I can say personally, loves me. He has forgiven me. Because of his great, unfathomable love, he went the way of the cross. He suffered and died for my sins. And friend, he suffered and died for your sins as well, whether you believe it or not. This God is not harsh. He always holds out his arms and he says, Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He is the one who is especially encouraging us now. We're in this time of grace. We don't know how long it's going to last, but eventually, maybe soon enough, it comes to an end. And so he says, I've blessed you with all sorts of gifts and talents in your life. Use them or lose them. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.